The Runekeeper is my latest class for Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition, which you can pick up over on the Dungeon Masters Guild right now for $12.95. This class expands out the rune magic system of the Rune Knight from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything into a full 1st to 20th level class. Learning how to jump in and pilot this thing might feel a little overwhelming, especially when you see the document is 69 pages long, so I'm going to talk you through the Runekeeper's intended playstyle, give a brief overview of its features and subclasses, and suggest some entry runes for you to pick up to get a feel for this thing. So let's start out with its playstyle. The plan going into this design was to make something that provided the modularity of a cleric, with flavors hitting on Artificer, Warlock, and Wizard thematics. In combat, the Runekeeper itself is a flexible, intelligence-based gish that sits comfortably with its class loadout in the midline, right at about half your speed away from the enemy. Your Keeper's dialect and rune selections can potentially shift your role and zone in combat. Armor runes can make you a frontline tank, magic runes let you get cozy with a wizard and sorcerer and back, Life runes up your healing potential, and you can enchant weapons with weapon runes that redefine how you think about the attack action. In the interaction and exploration pillars of play, I had a lot of fun seeing the Runekeeper as a sort of arcane demo man with a hermetic intuition feature. This mechanic is a carryover from 4E's Rune Priest that gives you a measure of safety when searching for and interacting with magic traps and items. After that, the rest of the class with its skill proficiencies makes you out to be a party brain and dungeoneer. Now that I've given you a brief overview, let's go through the PDF together for a rundown of the class features. So in starting with creating a Runekeeper, your hit points are going to get a D8 per Runekeeper level, proficiencies, light armor, medium armor, and shields, weapons, simple weapons, war hammers, and pole arms, tools, calligrapher supplies, and one type of artisan's tools of your choice, that way you can actually inscribe runes, do all your carving and whatnot, saving throws, intelligence and wisdom, skills, choose two from arcana, history, insight, investigation, nature, perception, and religion. There, it's making this out to be that midline brain that I was talking about earlier. Uh, some people have had questions about pole arms. Pole arms are ones like spears, glaives, lances, all that. Uh, this is another carryover from 4E that we saw in the Rune Priest over there. Equipment, you start out with the following equipment in addition to equipment granted by your background. A, a light crossbow and 20 bolts, or B, a simple weapon. A, a scholar's pack, or B, a priest pack a set of artisan's tools you're proficient with, leather armor, any simple weapon, and a quarter staff. The rules for multiclassing with the Rune Keeper are listed in the sidebar right here, and starting out with a runic lore feature. So let's get into the real meat and potatoes of this entire thing, the class features. So starting out with a runic lore, this is going to be the magic system, how you're going to get your runes and invoke them. Uh, this functions much in the same way as a wizard's spellcasting feature, but the runes themselves have a mechanic that separates them from spells. Your runic lexicon, this is going to function much in the same way as a wizard's spellbook. You have a lexicon of runes which are fixed into your mind and contain four runes of your choice. These are runes that you know, they don't actually count towards any of the bonuses from additional inscribed runes in your runes that you'll get later on. Uh, these are just runes that you know and you have to inscribe them in order to get their benefits. With this runic lexicon, you can also add these runes to this lexicon if you encounter them on your adventures. So DMs, this is a prompt for you to use some of these runes, maybe in traps or just inscribe them in the side of a cave or something like that. That way your runekeeper can go and find these, add them to their lexicon and inscribe them on the weapons and stuff. Inscribing runes. This is a magical process that I consider to be like you are contemplating or meditating upon the runes like truths because these runes are diagrams of infallible laws of physics so you could just carve the rune into an object but it's this process this meditative magical awakening that we call inscription that evokes the runes magical properties and makes it to where you can even invoke it later on so like i say here while you might permanently carve or paint a rune into an object it's the magical meditative process of inscription that awakens its potential and makes it available for you to invoke. The rune can be inscribed into any object unless a specific object or type of object is detailed in its prerequisites. These are usually things like a weapon, maybe a specific weapon because the mechanic is necessary for that to function, like a ranged weapon, and then you can't really just inscribe that into a shield, right? Your inscribed rune remains on the object indefinitely, but when you die, the rune vanishes after a number of days have passed equal to your intelligence modifier, minimum of one day. The rune also vanishes if you somehow remove it from your runic lexicon. You can change which runes you have inscribed when you finish a long rest. 
the maximum number of runes you can inscribe at a time appears in the inscribed runes column of the rune keeper table. An object can only bear one of your inscribed runes at a time. If you inscribe a rune that would exceed your limit of inscribed runes, you choose which one to dismiss. Once a rune is inscribed, it provides a passive effect and can be invoked. So each of these runes, and we'll get into them here in a second, will give you a passive effect and then you can invoke it once per long rest and until you get this causal invocation feature to do a temporary spell-like effect. Uh, so let's go down and look at one of these. So looking at Hervog, this is a Dwarvish rune for weapon. You must inscribe this onto a simple or martial weapon made of stone or metal. The weapon will become a magic weapon once it's inscribed. The wielder can use a bonus action to cause the metal or stone of the weapon to become silver until the creature wielding it uses a bonus action to dismiss it or until they drop or sheath it. This is the passive effect, so this is on as long as the rune is inscribed. Additional runes. This rune grants a bonus to attack and damage rolls made with the weapon equal to the number of runes you have inscribed from its language or that share its translations divided by three to a maximum of plus three. So I love this narrative that the runes themselves will actually gain power from other runes that you have inscribed that share some sort of relationship with this rune. So if they are weapon runes or they're dwarvish runes, they'll count towards this total and eventually this will provide potentially up to a plus three to attack and damage rolls. Now, I already know what you're thinking. What about magic items that already provide a plus three to attack and damage rolls? This is actually clarified up here in combining rune effects. So I'll give a shout out to Benjamin Huffman here because it was his magus that really set the standard for what this could do. Uh, and this mechanic right here, and this really helps to keep this in check. Uh, the effects of different spells, runes, and magic items add together while their durations overlap, with the exception of spells and runes that grant a plus one, two, or three bonus to attack and damage rolls or to AC. These bonuses are not cumulative, so use whichever bonus is higher. So if you have a plus one magic weapon and you inscribe one of your runes on it, you can get the inscribed effect out of that, but with the additional runes that you have, it's only going to assume whichever bonus is higher. If it's a plus one weapon and you can get plus two out of the runes that you have inscribed, that doesn't mean that it's going to be a plus three, that means it's going to be a plus two bonus. Additionally, runes that share the same name do not count towards a rune's additional runes benefits. For example, if you inscribe two Aegis runes from the Elven language, they do not add towards each other's additional runes effects. This means that you're going to have to keep inscribing different runes to get this bonus. Different weapon runes, different Dwarvish runes, etc, etc. I, I didn't want you to just be able to keep stacking the same rune on top of itself and just crap out a bunch of, you know, plus one weapons really super early on. It's possible that you can get a bunch of plus one weapons with this pretty early, uh, but your runic portfolio is going to have to be pretty diversified for that to work out. So let's talk about invoking runes, and then we'll go back into that rune that we just looked at. Invoking runes. While other creatures can attune to and benefit from your inscribed runes, only you can invoke them. Invoking a rune calls for the action specified in its description and lasts for its duration. You must be able to either touch the rune or speak its name to invoke it, and anything that would prevent you from casting a spell also prevents you from invoking a rune. For example, if you or one of your runes were within an area of anti-magic, you could not invoke the rune. If multiple objects bear the same rune you have inscribed, you choose which of the runes you invoke. When you invoke a rune, it becomes inert until you inscribe it again. Inert runes cannot be invoked but still provide their passive effect. So in a way, this feels a bit like Vancean magic, except it's still going to provide that passive effect, right? Once I invoke this rune, it's gone and I've got to invoke something else. I'm not going to be using spell slots with this. Except there is a later level feature that you'll get, Causal Invocation, that will make this feel a bit more like spell slots. So now that we know how invocation works, let's go back down to Hervog and check out this invoked effect. So by invoking it, it takes you one bonus action, duration of one minute. This all should feel pretty familiar. Uh, the wielder of Hervog, when you invoke it, cannot be frightened by any creature it has ever damaged. I thought that this was such a cool thematic here. If, you're, if the wielder has actually dealt damage to that creature, it's just immune to being frightened by it. This felt like dwarven tenacity. I, I love the narrative of this one so much. Uh, and I mentioned earlier that other creatures can attune to your runes. They don't all require attunement specifically. It will call that out in its attunement tag right here if that rune will require that. 
but this means that this weapon can be passed around by your buddies. So whenever you invoke it, it's the creature that's currently wielding it that can't be frightened by any creature it has ever damaged. Later on, you could possibly pass this around and make it to where it's like a sort of team-based immunity to frighten a certain creature, but that's going to require a lot of setup to really make that work. And in a game where like action economy is pretty king, I don't think that this is going to be all that insane. Now, some of you out there might be wondering, because I mentioned it earlier, that you can get access to magic and how is this rune keeper going to cast spells? Well, if you invest into magic runes, you're going to get a taste of how their spellcasting system works out. So, when a creature with a spellcasting or pack magic class feature spends a short or long rest holding the object inscribed with this rune, the spells on the following table are added to their spells known. They must otherwise obey all the restrictions for selecting the spell, and it becomes a spell from their class's spell list for them. The creature loses these benefits if another creature gains them through the object, or if you remove the inscription. So through holding this object over a shorter or long rest, the creature is going to just know, cause fear, dragon's breath, fear, Leoman's secret chest, and summon draconic spirit. Those are just in their spells known, and they can cast them with any spell slots that they have. Now, this is a class that doesn't have a spell casting feature, so how are you going to access any spell slots to cast these spells? Well, by invoking the rune, you gain a spell slot that can only be used to cast a spell granted through this rune within the duration. You choose the level of the spell slot granted, up to a level equal to half your inscribed runes, rounded down. You can only ever get 10 inscribed runes, so the maximum for this, hey, it's going to be a 5th level spell slot. And the only runes that are going to actually count towards this are runes that are magic runes or that are from this rune's language. And once you invoke this rune, you must spend runic charges equal to twice the spell slot's level to invoke it again. And we'll talk about that here in a minute. It's a, another one of the rune keeper's features that they get at fifth level that adds into runic charges. Polyglot, this is their other first level feature. Your studies of runes supernaturally develops your linguistic capabilities, granting you the eyes of the rune keepers. You can read all writing. Further, when you finish a long rest, you can replace any standard or exotic language you know with another standard or exotic language. See the Player's Handbook, page 123. You cannot replace common with this feature. So no matter what, you're always going to know common. Polyglot is just basically like a flexible expanded spell list in a way in that your portfolio of runes is opened up. Uh, you can learn the rune and add it to your runic lexicon, but you have to know its language in order to inscribe it and invoke it and everything. So what this does, let's say that you know common, draconic, and elvish, but there's a dwarvish rune that you really, really want to pick up. You can swap out either draconic or elvish in order to inscribe that dwarvish rune. It could be added to your lexicon no matter if you know the language or not, but you can't inscribe it on an object unless you know how to read, speak, and write that language. So this is making it to where you can inscribe that rune onto an object, and then let's say you want to change it out later. After you finish a long rest, you can swap it out for another language and re-inscribe a different rune. I, just, I really like the way that this took shape over time, because it was just the Eyes of the Rune Keeper invocation from the Warlock where you can read all writing, and I was pretty okay with that just sitting there at their first, but I was like, ah, they need some flexibility here. And they need something that's not going to like incentivize players to pick up the linguist feat. And sure, you can pick that up, but what that would wind up doing is potentially making a kind of redundant build with omniscience here, granting you the ability to speak and write all languages. Th this is something that I've been tussling with here. Uh, how not to make the build feel a little bit redundant right there. I don't really want to punish players for that, so what I would recommend is like DMs, if you allow this at your tables, you might just tell players, hey, your polyglot's going to get you a lot of the love that you want out of something like Linguist. Um, the ability to read all writing might make it to where Linguist is just not that great of a pickup. But Linguist also comes with a little kicker to it. So it might still not be all that bad for them to pick up. I mean, especially at early levels and all the practical levels, really. We're really only thinking that player characters are going to play up to like maybe here to 10th level. But we still want to make sure that everything from 11th and up is still working, churning, yeah, really practical for 5e. So moving on, after first level, at second level you're going to get your Keeper's Dialect and your Rune Stance. Uh, let me cover Rune Stance first because your Keeper's Dialect is your choice of subclass and we'll talk about some of the subclasses here in a second. Rune Stance is a stance switch mechanic. You switch the stance as a bonus action on your turn. Uh, this is also a thematic that was kind of a carryover from 4th edition Rune Priest. So you have a destruction or a protection stance, 
and while you're in this stance, you emanate an aura of your rune magic that extends to 10 feet. And in that aura, you choose between one of these two stances, which lasts until you switch to another stance or you're knocked unconscious. Destruction stance, the first time an enemy within the area takes damage on a turn, it takes extra damage equal to half the number of runes you have inscribed. So overall, like right here, we're talking about an extra one damage, right? Every single turn though, your party's average damage output is looking like maybe a plus four per round, possibly even plus five right here. Protection stance, the first time you or your allies within the area take damage on a turn, the damage taken is reduced by an amount equal to the number of runes that you have inscribed. This is another thematic that's a bit of a carryover from 4th edition, where the rune priest was a bit about flat damage reduction or flat damage increases. So with this destruction and protection stance, the flat increase is going to be based off of the number of runes that you have inscribed, and you're going to have to keep building into this class to get the real power out of this thing. I mean, even here at second level, being able to reduce the damage by one is actually kind of significant. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing those stories where this really comes in clutch and saves some of your buddies. So your Keeper's Dialects, in this class supplement, you're going to get six different subclasses. You get Deathic, Fiendish, Gukliak, Eocaric, Jotun, and Supernal. Deathic, these are traditionally Dwarvish runes, they are more about this idea of I'm going to enhance weapons, armor, and possibly give life to certain objects. Fiendish, this is a pretty twisted, cruel kind of a runic language. Uh, it is specializing in Abyssal and Infernal runes, which you'll find whenever you look through the supplement. These are the ones that are about like torture, cruelty, selfishness, uh, they're, they're pretty nasty. Uh, if you want to go over and make a necromantic kind of a rune keeper, check out Abyssal. The uh, Quaffix rune was a real favorite on stream. Kukliak, these are goblin runes. Uh, someone came up with the idea for goblin runes in one of the live streams and I, I had to roll with it. This is too funny of a thematic and we really had to find a justified reason why these wouldn't just blow up. Like why is an explosion not just the main cause of it, right? Uh, you're gonna find a lot of puns in these runes uh, and throughout this runic language right here. This is just about the mayhem. If you want to roll up like a wild magic sorcerer, kind of an equivalent, Gukliak might be your go-to. Eakark, this is my attempt at making a Dragon Knight or a Dragoon from Final Fantasy really makes sense for D&D 5e. Uh, I had tried to make this kind of a concept as fighter subclasses back in the day, uh, but it always felt like this just really called for magic in some capacity. With the Runekeeper being a dedicated Gish and augmenting the way that the laws of reality work for you, this actually made a lot of sense in my mind as to how you can make a Dragoon in D&D. So they get this Dragon's Ascent feature that allows you to jump like crazy, like all the Dragoons get. Uh, you can choose one of the specialized rune stances later on that also allows you to hover in the air like we see a lot of Dragoons do. Jotun, I figured if I was going to be replacing the Rune Knight from Tasha's, I might as well make it to where you can still build that kind of a character concept out if you go over in the Rune Keeper and specialize in Jotun. I feel like the magic that's surrounding that subclass makes a whole lot more sense if it's attached to a semi-caster in a way rather than the fighter chassis. Yeah, yeah. The narrative just to me made more sense in a full caster or a full invoker rather uh, as opposed to just the pure martialist that fighter is. Though it's not going to play completely like the Rune Knight, it still has its own flares on what the thematic is supposed to be. Uh, you can get a more diverse runic portfolio if you go with this option, but I still think that you can create the same kind of character as you would with the Rune Knight that's in Tasha's. Sofernal, if you are wanting to specialize in healing as a Rune Keeper, no doubt this is going to be the way to definitely go. Uh, you are going to focus a lot more on being a support with this subclass in particular, uh, more so than any of the others. The way that the Rune Keeper is going to do healing is by playing with hit dice, a mechanic that I've always felt was pretty underserved in 5e. And actually their capstone, Century of the Peacemaker, is another adaptation from a if I remember right, there was a pretty higher level rune that was in 4e that just felt so right as a capstone. Uh, as an action, you can censor a creature with the icons of light and peace. When you do choose a creature, you can see within 120 feet of you. The creature's will bends to unbreakable pacifism. When the target tries to take the attack action or cast a spell that deals damage, it must make a wisdom saving throw. 
On a failure, it becomes blinded until the start of its next turn. If the target fails three of these saves, it's blinded for seven days. On a success, the target is unaffected. If the target succeeds on three of these saves, the effect ends. Once you use this feature, you cannot do so again until you finish a long rest. I, I felt like these, like, you know, roll three saves kinds of effects like we see in Contagion could be manipulated to a pretty great effect as something like a capstone here. Uh, you know, Contagion has its own problems. But here, as a capstone, as a one-off feature, like, oh, this just felt... Oh, man, this just felt like holy vengeance. I, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of bragging on myself here, but I'm just, like, really proud of this one. Not only are you getting the subclasses for the Runekeeper, you're also getting some subclasses that are one-third invokers for Druid, Fighter, and Wizard. Uh, I've got a few more planned. I've got one for Artificer that is basically already written, and I definitely need to get one for Rogue because I have so many Thieves Camp runes in here. Uh, that'll definitely be a thing to look forward to in the future. Wait, so let's go back up. Uh, Hermetic Intuition. You can open your mind to the Resonance of Creation, allowing you to sense magical energy around you. You do so as an action, which places you under the effects of the Detect Magic spell, as long as you maintain concentration on it. Further, when you are aware of magic's presence on an object or surface, you can freely interact with it without causing any spell or magical effect to trigger. Uh, this is what I meant by that Arcane Demo Man kind of a feel, and I think builds into the idea of the Runekeeper being a, a Dungeoneer. This is a feature I'm really eager to hear some playtest feedback on. If you've got it out there, you've gotten some use out of this, please, please, please hit me up. I'd love to hear about uh, the overall feel of it. Fourth level, you get the standard ability score improvement. Uh, fifth level, you get your causal invocation feature. By tapping into the essence of creation, you gain the ability to invoke one of your inert runes by using runic charges. You gain a number of these charges equal to half your runekeeper level rounded down. You can choose one of your inert runes and invoke it again by spending runic charges. Unless otherwise stated in its invoked effect, an inert rune only requires one runic charge to invoke. You regain all your spent runic charges when you finish a long rest. So this is upping your overall invocation potential by about half. This was a way to reduce down the rune mastery feature that we saw in Tasha's down to an earlier level feature for the rune keeper. Uh, over there in Tasha's, they're just able to invoke them twice for shorter long rest. Reducing that down here makes it to where you get a bit more flexibility into these runes that you invoke and you can get it to them at an earlier level without really blowing out the power budget. I love how this one turned out and a huge, huge thank you to Ross for really kind of implanting the idea for this one into my brain. Harmonic Attunement, now that we are getting into the second tier of play, at 7th level, when a creature attunes to a magic item that bears one of your inscribed runes that also requires attunement, attuning to the item also attunes the creature to the rune without the rune counting against their limit of attuned magic items. Cool. So. This, I, I wanted to make it to where the requirement of attunement wasn't so restrictive and anti-fun, uh, but rather something that was necessary for the narrative of a magical effect. But here eventually, if somebody gets a really nice magic item, but you still want to inscribe your rune and possibly augment the magic item in a way, here you go. Rune chant. Rune chant is a mechanic that had existed, but not this mechanic. Uh, previous editions had used it as a form of like quickly invoking a rune that you don't have prepped, which I, with the overall palette expanding it like it is, I thought was probably going to wind up being too good. However, another video game that helped to inform this design was Skyrim. And with Skyrim, they have their dragon shouts, Fus Roda, all that good stuff. Uh, when you use your action to invoke a rune, you can invoke two runes that you have inscribed with an invoking time of one action. When you reach 20th level in this class, you can invoke up to three runes with this feature. Fus, Fus, Ro, Fus, Ro, Da. That, that, that felt like such a cool cinematic, like, oh, leveling up right there. Yeah, I, eh. again, there's so much of this that I'm just like so happy with. Uh, Omnipresence. At 11th level, you are always aware of the location of any of your inscribed runes, even if the rune is on a different plane of existence as you, and if you die, your inscribed runes remain inscribed on the object while you are dead. And this is kind of a way to also world build where these other rune keepers that have inscribed their runes onto magic items. Why are the runes still there? Why are they still powerful? Well, they were inscribed a long time ago. Those rune keepers have since passed away and the objects remain there with their runes still inscribed on them. I, I, I think the narrative of that kind of tells itself. Uh, omniscience, I spoke about this one a little bit earlier. And then omnipotence. 
the range of your rune stance increases to 30 feet. I, I just like this little trio of features right here. Omni omnipresence, omniscience, and omnipotence. I wanted that kind of poetry to really tell itself. You know, if you look over at my dancer, they've got uh, break a leg is their very entry level feature. And then curtain call is their very last one. So I, I, I like figuring out some kind of artsy fartsy way to kind of connect it all together. So some runes that I would recommend that you pick up if you are just rolling up a first level character. Uh, I really love Nurn. It's the friend rune for Dwarvish. It's one that has to be inscribed on a simpler martial weapon that weighs no more than five pounds and it's going to require attunement. The weapon gains the throne property with a normal range of 20 feet and a long range of 60 feet. This is something that uh, you might recognize as like the mechanic from the Dwarven Thrower, right? We're going to turn what's conventionally a martial weapon into a long range, you know, ranged weapon. Uh, immediately after the a ranged attack is made with this weapon, it returns to the attuned creature's hand, so now it becomes a loyal weapon. It's a loyal friend. Yeah, I, I thought this was a really, really fun one. Uh, you can invoke it as a bonus action on your turn, and for a minute, attacks made with a weapon deal an additional 1d8 damage against creatures that dealt damage to one of your allies within the last minute. So, this one, I think, feels like a whole, whole lot of fun. You can also inscribe this rune on objects that are inscribed with other runes from its language, and it shares those runes translations while inscribed on the object. So, if you go and pick up another Dwarvish weapon rune, let's say Axe, you can also inscribe friend on there and make it to where it's an axe that you can throw and, and it can return to your hand at the end of the turn if you want to get all Kratos with it, right? Let's say I know Druidic, but I also know Giant and I want to go pick up something from over here. Let's say I'm just going to pick up an armor rune, right? I want to get weapon armor. Feels like a pretty decent pick for first level. Uh, let's get Harbinon, the giant armor rune. I have to inscribe this on a suit of medium or heavy armor. The wearer has resistance to any damage from non-magical ranged weapon attacks. So, what this means is any bows, slings, anything like that, I'm going to get resistance to that damage type, right? Spellcasters are still going to have a pretty easy time hitting me, but this is nice, nice, nice at first level. Uh, additional runes. The rune creates a bonus to AC equal to the number of runes you have inscribed from its language, so giant, or that share its translations, so armor. I don't have either of those, so it doesn't provide this additional runes benefit. Then I could invoke this rune as an action, and for a round, I'm going to get resistance to the damage from any ranged attacks. This could be from magical ranged attacks, this could be from spell ranged attacks, yeah. Uh, so that's a basic rundown of about what this class can do uh, in shorthand. I hope that you all have a really, really fun time playing this one. Feel free to give me any feedback at indestructiveboy at gmail.com. Uh, I've appreciated a lot of the stories and it just critiques everything I've been hearing so far. Uh, it's gone a long way into improving this class, and I, I'm just so happy to know that this thing is out there in the wild. Uh, some people are already rolling this thing up and playing it at tables, so yeah. Anyways, that's going to be it for me on this one, guys. I am Taryn, Indestructible Boy Pounds. This has been the Rune Keeper. A huge shout out to my Patreon sponsors. Thank you all so much for helping me keep the lights on around here and coffee in my blood. You all are absolute heroes. And hey, I want to thank you all so much for being here. I hope that you all are staying safe, staying healthy, and I can't wait to see you in the next one.